And, and at the end of the day, the thing is, manned space flight, kind of awesome, kind of wish I could be part of it, but there isn't the budget in the world right now to do it right. We want to learn, we want to explore, we want to do science, and we have to use robots to do that. Hold on. <laughs> I'm sorry, should I just calm down? <laughs> no, bring it on, Dr. T. You're supposed to. <laughs> Testify. Plus, we got questions. <laughs> Tell the truth. I, and I want to make sure we get the questions, but I got to rebut gonna. that. Rebut that. Okay. Uh, to say there's no budget in the world, the federal budget is three point something trillion dollars. Doesn't go as far as it used to. If you... <laughs> yeah, it used to be real money. If you want to count to a trillion, it would take you 100,000 years, and that's one number per second every waking and sleeping moment of your life. That's how big that number is, point one. Point two, it's not that we can't afford it, it's that we have chosen to not afford it. Mm -hmm. I tweeted recently... <laughs> I tweeted recently that the U.S. bailout of the banks exceeded the 50-year budget of NASA. You want to put something in context, if you want to do something with three and a half trillion dollars, you can do whatever you want. The what, whatever you judge to be important to the profile yeah. of the nation that you were trying to build and to sustain. So I submit to you that when you look at the NASA budget, and I'm tired of saying this, but I'll have to say it again, the NASA budget is four-tenths of one penny on a tax dollar. If I held up the tax dollar and I cut horizontally into it four-tenths of one percent of its width, it doesn't even get you into the ink. So I will not accept a statement that says we can't afford it. <laughs> Just show me the money. Five, four, three, two, one. And we have ignition. And we have liftoff of Antares 543 mission to bring Cygnus on its third CRS mission to the ISS. Got main engines at 108%. Hi, Chris Hadfield here on the International Space Station. Fire is a bad thing on a space station. If we have a fire, it makes smoke. Smoke fills this place up, and uh, we'd be in a terrible situation. So we have quick don masks. Special masks that you squeeze the lever on, these inflate, put over top of your head, and this small bottle attached will give you, in the order of 10 or 15 minutes worth of oxygen until you can safely fight the fire uh, or evacuate to your Soyuz and close the hatch or get another mask ready, a longer term mask or a respirator. But this is our quick reaction right here. This bottle's getting old. Uh, in fact, it's expired. So what I'm going to do today is uh, just drain this oxygen tank so we get the free oxygen in the space station before we uh, put this in the cargo vehicle that returns to Earth. Free way to get oxygen to the space station. So the, the next few segments, um, I'll see if I can keep their attention, maybe not. But this is our daily life in space, and so I got to touch on what are we doing. Uh, first, th this is about a week in space, and I'm, I'm going to miss the tag here and whack my head on the bottom of the gem. Um, but you have to make mistakes to be successful, so eventually I'll, I'll get better at flipping around. But... And then there's the, uh, how many race fans do I have out there? Uh, I, I think people watch a race because secretly they want to see a crash. Even if you don't admit it, secretly you want to see a crash. Well, when you're in space, you secretly want something on the outside of the space station to break. Because the only way to fix that is to go outside in a spacesuit and do a spacewalk. And so you can see me down at the bottom. Uh, I'm just barely hanging on to the, uh, to the edge of the space station right there. Uh, right there. And Alex Gerst took this. With, it's a 10, 10 millimeter lens, so it kind of reshapes the Earth a little bit. Uh, but spacewalking. I spent 12 and a half hours outside the space station, six on this spacewalk, and then six and a half on my next one. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, you can, I would take 100 night carrier landings over one spacewalk. It was just physically grueling, mentally grueling, and you know that, uh, that every single thing you touch, if you don't tether it, you're going to lose it, and then they're going to make fun of you. Or 
If you break something, now you're gonna have to do another spacewalk to fix what you broke, and that would be very poor form. This, this video right here is, is more for the kids, but I think everybody will enjoy it. And I just wanted to demonstrate, well, a whole, whole crew wanted to demonstrate, like, what is something simple and what is it like when you take gravity away? So that's just a big ball of water, and now we're throwing a GoPro right into the middle of that ball of water. And so you see those little spheres in there? We had put an Alka-Seltzer into the water bubble, and it really didn't do anything. It just fizzled out, but it made those air pockets in there. And what I really love about this first is just how crazy water is in space. It's really wild. And I love Swanee's face right there. That guy's got a PhD in computer science, but he looks like he's five years old playing with a toy for the first time. There's uh, Oleg Artemyev, one of our, our Russian buddies. And I wanted to bounce, after we built that water bubble, then I wanted to play with water for the rest of my life. And so I wanted to bounce two water bubbles off each other. And in that one, I didn't get it. So I made some smaller water bubbles using a syringe and a Teflon catheter. And, uh, and then this basically, they give a Sunday off. Sunday is a day off. And this wasted my whole day right here. I could not put this down. I think the Ravens were playing and I had them up on the background and I just went for water. So here you'll see, I mean, if you hit it soft enough, you're bouncing water bubbles off of each other, which was just great. So water is also very dangerous on the space station because we have a lot of electricity. So we need to ver be very careful not to spill it. And I'll add a bubble of air. And uh, I love what happens with the air. So there's a little water added. I'll suck some air into the syringe and then pump a little air into the water bubble. And now you get an air bubble bouncing around the inner wall of the water bubble. And you can actually see me kind of in the lens through there. And then I'll take the syringe and I'll bounce the air bubble around on the inside of the water bubble. And then we had to know what happens when you put a human in the water bubble. And so, uh, in an unfortunate violation of all NASA rules, we built another gigantic water bubble. Um, apparently there's electronics that are sensitive to water. Uh, but we had towels, we were ready. And Alex didn't have hair, so he got volunteered as the guy to go into the water bubble. And of course, that wasn't room temperature water. We had it down to about 30, just over 32 degrees to make sure it was really pleasant for him. But you can see how wild that is. Uh, about a year before we did this, Luca Parmitano was on a spacewalk and he had water leaking into the helmet of his spacesuit. And he talked about how, how much it felt like he was going to drown. And I don't think anybody on Earth really recognized that. All he had was about a softball amount of water in his helmet. And he was talking about drowning? How is that even possible? And then when you look at that video and you, and you talk to Alex, water just sticks to you and then it wicks. And he said the creepiest feeling of that was the water going up his nostrils and down in his ear. And he's like, there would, if you couldn't have touched your face, there's no way to get that out. And so that's what Luca was dealing with in his spacesuit. And that started to put in perspective for us how serious that was and, and how lucky Luca was to make it out of that because he had good skills. <laughs> How, what is the state of the toilet today? I've been hearing you guys have been uh, working on it a bit. Well, the, the, the basic function of the toilet, as we understand them on planet Earth, uh, essentially is fine. That works fine. But what we're not able to do right now, which is a little bit of a concern from what we call water balance, is we can't turn today's coffee into tomorrow's coffee. So we're working on the water processor that uh, does all of that heavy lifting and work. So the, the espresso machine is broken. <laughs> Okay, give us, if you don't mind, give us a little more detail on this, because this is quite a difference now between what we had previously on, uh, on the shuttle and other spaceships, and now what you guys have going up there. So, and I know it's, it's, there's, there's reasons for it. it. It contributes to what we're going to be doing in the future exploration. Tell us a little bit more about uh, that whole process there. Well, actually, it, it, it boils down to trying our best to, to close the environmental control uh, in life support system loops. So what you'd like to be able to do is minimize what you carry to space. And, uh, and that's critically important because rocket fuel is expensive. And right now we spend probably 
20 uh, fold. We spend, uh, we, it takes about 20 pounds of rocket fuel and or tank and or other piece parts of a rocket to get one pound of uh, payload into, into space. So all the water that we have here, we would like to be able to recycle it. So the way we get rid of water, be it uh, through exhaling, urination, all of that, you'd like to be able to take and, and uh, get every molecule of water back uh, into, the, into the loop here, and that's what we try to do, and that's what that system does ordinarily. And the system consists of three major pieces. One is the space toilet, and that's plumbed into this other great big box that rumbles and, and, and massages your feet, and out from that comes water, and that water goes into our new galley, and then you go uh, uh, get your, your bag of coffee and make a coffee. Here I am, and I got my water. So first of all, I'd like to show you um, how water behaves in weightlessness, which is kind of uh, interesting. Uh, of course, it doesn't fall down um, like it does on Earth, and it kind of tends to stick to your skin because of surface tension. if you can see it. You can see it doesn't really want to move away from your hand. We have power bricks. You see all these things, uh, these this blue bricks for, for power, power supply. And just to show you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't use all that water to wash um, just because it's, it's a little bit difficult to control. So I'm actually going to dry it off. Hi, my name is David Greenwood, and I was one, and I'm in grade six. And I was wondering about how much space junk is there in the Earth's atmosphere that you can see from the space station. All space is full of, of you know, junk or debris. The Earth gets hit by a hundred tons a day of space debris. A hundred tons a day hits our Earth every time you see a shooting star. Or, um, or you know, a, a meteorite or something. Th those are bits of debris coming from the universe. A hundred tons a day. Some of it is is human-made. Only a little bit, but there is some. And from the space station, though, everything's going really, really fast. We are going uh, five miles a second, eight kilometers a second. So all the debris is going faster than a bullet. So you can't see it normally. The only time I've ever seen space debris is when. Uh, it burned up in the atmosphere underneath me, and I watched a meteorite burn up in the atmosphere. And that was kind of a spooky feeling, because that meteorite could have hit us and, and not just been caught by the Earth's gravity into the atmosphere. But even though we know there's some around, space is big, and uh, we get peppered by tiny bits all the time. But the space station's a good ship, big, strong ship, and uh, so far, so good. Don and uh, Dan, how do you hear? Hey, Mass, we got you loud and clear. We, uh, we did want to ask you about uh, repairs you might be doing on the station. And both of you guys have been to my house uh, working. Both times I put my foot through the ceiling of my house in the attic, Dan came over and fixed it. And so I've been staying out of the attic until, Dan, you come, come back to Earth. And, Don, you've helped me with uh, air conditioning problems and my car. So we're just really sweating it out in my house until one of you guys at least gets back to Earth to help out again. But what's going on up there? You're both very handy guys. What's going on up there? What have you guys been doing to fix stuff? Well, on our holiday weekend here, the toilet broke. <laughs> and you can imagine all work comes to a stop on station when the toilet breaks. And so Dan and I spent most, the uh, better part of a day uh, working on the toilet. And there was a lot of downlink video from that, so you may want to see it. It was, we were digging down inside of the panels of the toilet, uh, working on uh, making sure everything was going to uh, turn out okay. Key 4OH. I don't know if that's like a... It's a ham radio call sign. Ham K radio? K4OH. K4OH. This is K4OH. Ask, Mark, Ian, 
What landing tech would you make with an infinite budget? <laughs> Thank you for the infinite budget. We've been waiting for that. Cushions um, of money to land software. Yeah, we just yeah, layer the ground with $100 bills. Yeah.